It's recording now. I didn't hear an announcement, but it is showing that it is recording. So without further ado, let's start our webinar. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us here today. Um, it is about time to start thinking about something that Congress does every year called August recess. And it is something that has grown in visibility and in importance strategically uh, every year uh, since the Obama administration. Right now, there's even been some discussion about canceling the August recess, as we have found working with Congress for over 20 years, it takes a whole lot to move Congress from um, its normal way of doing things. So I think the, any announcements that there will not be some sort of August recess are premature. And as with most things, you do want to be up and actively pursuing your strategy no matter what Capitol Hill is saying so that you're ready when the time comes to interact with your lawmakers. Today, we're going to be talking about what associations can be doing during the August recess. Uh, one of the things we want to share are some of the ways that different organizations choose to interact with members of Congress while they're home during this month-long summer break. And there are choices to be made. I think in the past couple of years, we've seen that town hall meetings um, are, are getting a lot more attention than they ever did in terms of the news media and their visibility. And in terms of putting public pressure on elected officials, they certainly have risen in prominence. On the other hand, there are some other choices with your members at home, and they include things like a meeting for just you and your group or what you're looking at here, um, a site visit where you can bring the member of Congress to you and have a focused discussion on your issues versus a, a, a kind of briefer discussion in front of the community. Both are strategically helpful in different contexts. So we're going to explore that a little bit in the hopes of giving you some direction in terms of not doing everything you can think of, but doing the few things that your resources will allow you to do during this summer break. I'm Christopher Kush, CEO of Soapbox Consulting. We are part of the IS network. Um, Soapbox is a grassroots advocacy firm. We are uh, going into our 21st year here in Washington, D.C., and those of you who do fly-ins in Washington uh, might be familiar with us. Most of the large public interest groups use Soapbox as a way to schedule their appointments, prepare their advocates, and provide other services during their fly-ins and lobby days. Angela Taylor is Vice President of Soapbox Consulting. She is the person who does most of the campaigns that are outside of the Beltway for us. She has scheduled literally hundreds of site visits and district meetings over the years. And um, she will be sharing some of the tips and tricks she has learned um, doing that work. Jamie Tucker, who is the Director of Public Policy, will help us get a better sense of the issues that are in play. Uh, especially in terms of tax reform this August, which can help us together speak with a unified voice on things that are currently rolling through Congress. So that'll be very interesting up to the minute suggestions of the kind of conversations and interactions you can have with your members of Congress back at home. Okay, and now to make it more accessible, we're going to go into cartoon land. So uh, the rest of the webinar will focus on three things. One is why August recess is so important. We'll talk a little bit about why we do it and what the choices are. That will be under the header, which options should I choose? Again, considering your resources, your issues, and your strategy, um, how you should you be conceiving of this August recess and what you might do. And then we'll bring in Angela and we'll talk about the best ways to actually make it happen, whether you want to do a town hall, whether you want to do a site visit. There are some insights we have that we can share, uh, both for folks who want to go it on their own, and we also have, the uh, as part of the IS network, the ability to plug in and have Soapbox do some of the lifting for you in terms of your recess strategy. But let's start with why it's important. So, and as we go through these slides, we're going to 
provide little glimpses of site visits and town halls and, and help you get an idea of what this stuff looks like at home. So here is a member of Congress um, checking out the uh, a lab, a research lab. So this would be considered a site visit. Okay. Why we get excited about August recess? One is that members of the House are usually home in their home districts on Mondays and Fridays, and they spend the rest of the week in Washington, D.C. August is the longest uninterrupted time that members of the House are at home in the district throughout the year. And something else has happened in the past couple Congresses where members are in Washington, D.C. a little less often than they used to be. And so not only does August provide the time when members are at home for the longest stretch, but there's been an emphasis on trying to move some of these discussions back to the districts where you are not competing against national organizations for every precious minute that the member is in the Capitol. We are in the middle of the 2018 appropriations process, so it is an excellent time for organizations to talk to members of Congress about budgets that um, are being funded for the, the upcoming year. So that process is by no means laid to rest and to become part of the discussion of the actual dollars that will be appropriated or available the following year, this is a very good time in that process to be visible and to let members of Congress know both what programs need and also how they're doing locally. I mentioned that there's a lot more news media attention these days on things like town hall meetings. We did see uh, when uh, the Affordable Care Act was first introduced, there was a concerted effort for and an organized effort to have folks show up at town hall meetings. That bill did end up getting passed uh, despite a lot of concerns raised in districts across the country. And it seems that now that people are trying to repeal the Affordable Care Act or replace it with something that the Senate has just released today and the House passed a few weeks ago, um, the other side is showing up at town hall meetings and getting similar news media attention for the folks who don't want um, to have their uh, health care or their access, health care access and availability to be um, removed or put into jeopardy. When you are at home because there are not votes happening and because there are not as many groups swirling around members of Congress, it provides a more relaxed environment for discussions. So when you're at home, if you are in a member of Congress's office, you will notice that it is possible to get over a half hour. It is possible to get an hour with a member of Congress to have more of an exchange back and forth. In Washington, D.C., on Capitol Hill, we're typically finding that meetings last about 15 minutes and are scheduled um, in 15-minute blocks. So uh, being at home provides the ability not only to access the member themselves a little easier, but to have a more relaxed exchange, something extremely conducive to relationship building. Final thing to keep in mind is that once members of Congress return from August recess, they are looking at their work till the end of the year. And leadership in both parties uses August recess to take the temperature of what's happening outside the beltway. So visibility during August recess has an agenda setting function. It is very helpful for the issues that our organizations care about to show up in August recess so they show up in the discussions when members return and ask, what were you hearing about in the district? If we could do three or four things between now and the end of the year, what would those be in light of what your constituents were saying? So those are, are some of the big reasons why we get excited about August recess and why when you see August roll around, if you belong to any networks, you'll see emails start flooding your inbox telling you that August recess is coming up and your members of Congress are going to be at home and you should 
do something. So many organizations know that August recess is important, either strategically or intuitively. They know they have a network or, or the people that, that are supporters, that they should contact them and tell them something about August recess. But the, it's not always clear to an organization, and they not they don't always have the time to think through uh, it, you know, if we don't have time to do everything, if our advocates don't have time to do everything, how do we go through and choose what would be most helpful for us to suggest the most helpful things that we should suggest to our advocates? And so we get to which options you should choose during August recess. As I mentioned, there is a choice. There are different things you can do during August recess. And I'm going to go over some of the main ones and what the differences are between them, because there are strategic choices to be made. There's advantages and disadvantages in terms of what you choose. Now, the most typical email or information that an advocate will get from an organization is to attend a town hall meeting if your member of Congress is going to have one. So a town hall meeting is when the member during August recess here you see Dave Brett in Virginia schedules a time in a local facility to explain what they've been working on on Capitol Hill and to take questions from the group. Those are public meetings, but as we said, they've ended up in the past couple of years being sometimes contentious exchanges with viral video. And for that reason, some members have backed away a little bit from public town hall meetings and have moved toward having electronic town hall or conference call town hall meetings. First, let's look at regular town hall meetings and, and think about the advantages and the disadvantages of those individual meetings. So the primary advantage is the public accountability that happens in town hall meetings. So strategically, you can have a place where not only the member of Congress sees the voters in the district being in support of your issues, but there's also a chance of getting on the news media with that attention. So in terms of a front burner issue, something like repealing and replacing Obamacare, something that is at the on the front page of the newspaper at the time there is the ability to get news media attention and to know that your neighbors uh, are going to care about the issues and be informed about it uh, there's much less of a vibe in the room if you are talking about something specific so if you are a trade association and you are focusing on a regulation or um, the reauthorization of a program where you want to make some tweaks to the program to bring it up to date. These kind of things are not necessarily going to be something that your neighbors are going to be cheering behind you about um, or that they might have any attention or have any information about. These will almost certainly not be the issues if the news media is in attendance that they would choose to show in a snippet about the event. So disadvantages. The crowd is probably only going to respond to front burner issues. There is a crowd and crowds have dynamics. So if you have an issue that in your district runs counter to the general sentiments, you also could set up a situation where rather than making arguments, you're instead showing the member of Congress that your position is unpopular. So the more difficult or the more divided your position, the more careful you have to be about choosing a town hall as a place to exchange information with your member of Congress. Signs and supporters are important in a public setting. So it's not just having you sign up to ask a question or to make a statement. Frequently, it takes you thinking about how many people could I get to show up? How many people could I get to show up and wear the same t-shirts? How many people could I get to make signs and then show up and wear the same t-shirts? So if you're looking at using a town hall as a place where you can provide some public pressure, 
there can be a lot of organizing that goes along with that. So you, the visibility in the room is as important, I would say, as the ability to get up and ask a question. There are brief exchanges in this kind of forum. So a complicated issue, an issue with nuances. I'd also say this, an issue that is easy to duck. So an issue that has a, a pat answer that you hear elected officials use to avoid going in depth on the issue. You're really in danger in a town hall meeting of not having a substantive exchange on the issue and not being able to chase down a lot of side issues. So you want to be thinking about in that environment, are we able to make our point to have our exchange in an extremely limited amount of time? Another thing that happens, town hall meetings tend to be held on nights and weekends, so people who have regular working hours can attend them. If you have advocates, that consider their nights sac sacrosanct um, or their weekends are completely booked for months in advance, it's not going to be a very helpful forum for you because you won't be able to get your advocates to put it on their calendars. A final thing that we are seeing, because these forums can be contentious, we are seeing that they are not announced in a uniform fashion. They are not announced six weeks before they happen. They are frequently announced in a limited way shortly before the events happen. So they require that your advocates look for and call and ask about when the town halls are going to be scheduled. It is not as simple as going to the House website, for example, and seeing the list of all the town hall meetings across the country during August. That list does not exist. So you're going to be, to take advantage of these, you're going to need either you or your advocates to be on top of the announcements. And those announcements can be made in mid-August. So um, it takes some tenacity in these days in order to get to some of those events. Let's talk about the alternative. So the alternative has been for members of Congress to schedule what they frequently refer to as electronic town halls. And what these are, are conference calls with a limited number of people from the district. So what these allow is for the members of Congress and their staff to vet the issues that will be brought up during a conference call, to have a sense of inviting people where a civil exchange is possible, to limit things like video that might be negative in a public setting, which is less controllable by the member of Congress, to limit the number of people who are there to witness um, any negative exchange that might happen with a constituent. On the other hand, there are some advantages. So one is that if you're on an electronic town hall, you almost certainly will have the ability to speak. You almost certainly will have the ability to ask the member a question about your issues. So you know that, that you will be able to underline your issue as being a priority for the district and have the ability to get a direct answer from your member. The other thing is that they typically happen in a very convenient location, your house. So your house or office can be used to call in to an electronic town hall meeting. So you do not have to travel to attend. Um, and for those of you who have kids and complicated schedules, long work hours, the ability to not have to leave the office or not have to get an additional ride from baseball practice is definitely a plus in terms of your availability to participate in something of this nature. The disadvantages, again, brief exchanges. So on a conference call, there might be five to 10 people. There's probably a question and an answer, and then the member will be moving on. So like in, in public forums, you're going to have a brief exchange. So you want to carefully think about your question so that it's not too open-ended and not easily deflected with a pat answer. These town halls do require advanced registration, 
So they do require that advocates are in touch with legislative offices, expressing their interest and availability of participating. I mentioned that there is limited public accountability. And I want people to think about the disembodied voices. So if I were going to choose between an electronic town hall and a regular town hall, I think one of the serious considerations for me would be FaceTime that standing in front of a member of Congress expressing concern about an issue is much more compelling than them listening to a voice and maybe somebody reading a pre-written down question. So in terms of them being able to remember you, in terms of them being able to, to see the sincerity of the issue, not to mention the ability of you to bring additional people to back you up and show support, the electronic town hall is not as rich an exchange as the public town hall meeting. Now on the theme of disembodied voices, I'm gonna to move to the exchanges that people choose to have where the focus is on one organization. And so there's really two basic choices for interacting with your member of Congress without the public or the rest of the community present. And they are district office meetings and site visits. So the difference with these are, these are meetings that your organization schedules to sit down and talk with a member of Congress to educate them about an issue, to find out how they feel about an issue. They specifically are created so that the broader community is not invited into that conversation. So there are pluses and minuses for this approach. The pluses. You get a direct exchange with the member that has plenty of time for you to go back and forth, to go deeper into the issue, to cover several facets related to the issue. Your issue does not have to be the front burner issue of, of the day. So it does not have to be about healthcare reform or the security of our elections for you to have an effective meeting. When you don't include the broader community, it's fine for you to focus on whatever aspect of the federal portfolio you are monitoring or you, that you are caring for. Uh, much better than trying to talk about, mm, I don't know, accounting regulations, something of that nature in front of the rest of the community that's, that's waiting to hoop and holler um, related to one of the front burr issues. Uh, so that, those are some of the advantages of having these kind of meetings. When I talk about the disembodied voices with the town hall calls, you want to think about what happens in terms of relationship building when you are face to face with a member of Congress talking about the people your agency cares for or the issues that you are, are studying through your organization. And they're able to look into your eyes and hear your name and hear your voice for a half hour focused on you. So, so that is a very big deal for us in terms of getting members of Congress to um, process who the people are at home and what the issues are that matter. Minuses. So members of Congress have a lot of folks that would like to have one-on-one -on -one meetings with them. So the scheduling process can be lengthy. And it's easier, I will tell you, for a district meeting for you to schedule the time because the member doesn't have to travel to a different location and um, you don't have to be part of a complicated schedule. You can be in their local office. That does not mean it's as easy to get to a one-on-one -on -one district meeting as it is to find out if they're having a town hall and arrange for some folks to attend. So the scheduling process takes some doing. It does take some back and forth. There is little or no public accountability. So um, when you are talking with a member of Congress, you know, usually, if they're learning about an issue, if you're trying to teach them some basics, if they're a new member of Congress, th they will specifically ask that the news media not be in attendance because they're having the exchange to learn. 
So this is not a place where you're able to use your grassroots to exert a lot of uh, or, or broad cross-section of power from the district. Although, as knowledgeable and concerned citizens, you are able to implicit, implicitly communicate that to a member of Congress by being in the office and having a good meeting. There is one disadvantage to this over the site visit, and that's that because you aren't walking through your environment, because they aren't seeing your location and maybe your clients, maybe your staff, your stats and your issues tend to be on paper only. So you would bring maybe some one sheets about tax reform, you know, the charitable deduction. You might bring some facts um, from your agency about the kind of people you are seeing, the kind of services you are providing. But those numbers tend to be on paper. So it's very similar to when you come to Washington, D.C. Uh, it is a different experience than taking your member of Congress through a site visit. A site visit is where you give the member of Congress the ability to come to the place where you're providing services, where, you, where your organization is located, and you're able to introduce a member of Congress to your staff, to your clients. You're able to, in your environment, not just maybe review the research you're doing, but show where the research is taking place. You are giving an experience to the member of Congress. And if we were talking about getting members of Congress to internalize and learn deeply about your issues and about your contribution to the district, this is an immersive way to do that. It's a way that is even better than having your facts and figures down on paper to share because it, it becomes part of their lives, part of their experiences as a member of Congress. So in terms of providing the best, most unforgettable way for them to learn about you and what you do, site visits are probably the best thing that you can do. But as with town halls, there's a difference if you choose to go this route. So the difference is that the public, the, the greater public won't necessarily be there to see and cheer you on and to be able to make a statement about a popular course of action. There is, however, time for the substantive discussion, the back and forth. I would argue that a site visit is so rich in terms of exchange that, that that site visits tend to yield good relationship um, building blocks, no matter how carefully or substantively the issues are thought out or shared. When we come to Washington, D.C., we tend to focus very specifically on our issues and what members of Congress could be doing the week that we see them. Uh, when we have site visits with members of Congress, sure, we can talk about the issues, but what we're really doing is inviting that member of Congress to be part of our world. Um, and so I find that they tend, as long as everybody is polite, they tend to be helpful experiences, even if they're not focused on support for a specific bill or something of that nature. Again, as with the district office meetings, because you are in your house and you're focusing on your issue, you do not need to have the front page issue of the day for these to be effective. Um, oh, so one of the things that you want to think about in terms of the negatives is that to get your member of Congress to have the time on their schedule to travel to your organization and walk around for an hour and ask some questions, that's going to probably take the most effort from you to schedule. So that's why we're having this webinar now and we're not having it in late July because it does take a lot of back and forths to make this happen. There's a great reward for the effort, um, but it is by no means, um, I think, ever a super easy, um, quick thing to get onto the calendar. The participants in the agenda for these exchanges must be managed by you, and you want to think about that for a moment, especially if you are a small shop. 
a town hall meeting, you can get onto your calendar, you can sign up if they want you to sign up in advance, and you can show up. Now you're done, basically. You can see if you can ask a question or make a statement, but there's very little other organizing you have to do aside from bringing your signs and your other community members if that's going to be something that's important to your message. With a site visit, you're going to have to organize the entire event. So a site visit requires that you think about the issues you're going to share. It requires that you think about if you're taking a member of Congress on a tour, what the tour will see, what the tour will not see. And it requires that you think about who you want to invite and how you will brief those folks and how you will let them know how the tour or the meeting will flow. So a site visit not only takes more effort on your shoulders in terms of getting it scheduled, it does take more effort because you are the one who's holding the party. You are the one who has to think through a lot of the organizational details to make them happen. So what I want to do now, I want to stop there and I want to move along to some of the issues that are percolating um, this August. And I'm going to turn it over to Jamie Tucker who can help us triangulate on what you might want to do this August by letting us know what some of the issues that are in play are, and that might be the point of your discussion this summer. So, Jamie? Thank you so much, Christopher. And I cannot underscore or emphasize in any other adverb, adjective that I need to do uh, beyond to sort of kind of compliment your message on the site visits. It's been my experience over my career and seeing this with members of Congress, um, that is the best way to to form a long lasting relationships. Uh, it's certainly much harder for a member to go back to Washington and think about spending cuts or tax reform, charitable giving in an aggregate sense that they've seen something on the ground in their district or their state that impacts um, constituents more broadly. It's a fantastic way to connect um, and it does have a lot of impact moving forward. And I've seen long-lasting, wonderful relationships between members and local organizations developed over time because of visits just like that. So I am happy to talk about issues, and you see three key, three key issues on your screen. Uh, by no means do I suggest these are the only issues um, that you may care about. Certainly there may be some, if not many, or all listed that are, that are not currently on your radar screen, um, and that's okay. You know, we would never ask you to not, when you have the opportunity to stand in front or sit in front of your members of Congress to speak upon the issues that are most important to you. Um, but these are issues that are likely are going to come up in the course of conversation. If you do have meetings, if you do attend town halls, um, if you're able to engage, and we hope you do uh, during this period. So I want to speak for a minute on tax reform. Uh, you may have heard, um, if you're not here in D.C., it seems to be all that people are talking about outside of health care. But you may have heard in the news and, and throughout that there is an effort to pursue comprehensive tax reform. Even the speaker, uh, Speaker Paul Ryan, made a very impassioned speech earlier this week about the fact that this, this is a once-in-generation moment. And I think the leadership here in Washington really believes that. Um, from the charitable uh, community's perspective in terms of tax reform, what we know right now, um, there are not a lot of details. Um, but – in the proposals, the blueprints, and the various documents that have been put out in the world thus far, uh, we do understand that some changes to the individual side might have an unintended consequence of negative impacts on charitable giving. Uh, the charitable introduction is preserved in all of these plans, but at the same time, it would only be available for a very small fraction of taxpayers. We've been concerned about this uh, over the past year in conversations that we've had with elected officials, and we begin thinking about what a potential solution might be. Uh, you'll learn more from some materials that we're going to be we're, that we'll be providing for our members uh, throughout July and August. Um, if you have not seen already, we commissioned some research with Indiana University to take a look at this idea of if the new uh, the new world order of tax uh, regime comes into play, if fewer people are able to take advantage of the charitable reduction, how can we correct for that problem? Uh, we're looking at something that is uh, called the universal or non-itemizer deduction as a way to correct for that, that would allow for all taxpayers, regardless of income, regardless of their filing status, uh, to receive some benefit for donating to charity. Um, we are excited about, about this proposal. It has, received, has garnered a lot of positive feedback on the Hill thus far. And uh, the materials that we're putting together, and they won't just be limited to one-pagers or, 
or stale documents. Uh, we're looking at different ways to be more interactive, to be helpful to you, no matter how you may choose to pursue uh, conversations with your members in August on this issue. Um, but we do think uh, that the time is ripe for these conversations. We've heard that the House, Senate, and the administration are really going to move forward on a one-bill strategy. So taking a different tack from what they've done on the healthcare side and trying to come together with the goal of having a legislative draft ready by September. So August really is a wonderful time, July and August really wonderful times, um, to make this impassioned plea to talk about the impact of charitable giving for your organization and, and to um, really let them know um, kind of how the community functions and how it depends upon uh, the generosity how for centuries of depending on the generosity of, of all Americans. Now, the Johnson Amendment is another issue um, <clears throat> that may or may not have come across, uh, you know, your desk. Um, it has been primarily um, a, a sort of a, a Washington type issue. Um, there's been a great effort by our partners, the National Council of Nonprofits, to really bring this issue further out into the communities and across the country. Um, and we've been working closely with them. But what the Johnson Amendment is, if you're unfamiliar, it is the current prohibition on political activity for 501c3 organizations. And this has been around for the past 63 years. As a result of then Senator Lyndon Johnson, um, who was having an issue with uh, nonprofit organizations in Texas, um, raising money against his uh, reelection campaign. Um, and he put the amendment in place as part of a bill in 1964. It has remained in place relatively unchallenged for the past uh, over 60 years. What we're finding now is that a lot of the arguments in support of repealing the Johnson Amendment are, are based on the idea of religious liberty. Uh, concerns that uh, churches or, or, or clergy members uh, would somehow be dragged from the pulpit uh, if they were to make, a, make a, uh, a comment about a political candidate or issue within the course of, uh, of regular business or activities of the church. Um, that's something that is, is not currently an issue. Um, it has been overblown a bit, but there is there have been some First Amendment concerns that have made this issue very complicated. From the charitable sector's perspective, uh, for the past 60 years, we have enjoyed protections against engaging in political activity, really keeping the nonprofit sector as one of the few places uh, left in the United States that is uh, truly nonpartisan, a way to talk about issues and bringing people together. Rather than divisiveness, we are concerned if the Johnson Amendment is repealed, we create a whole new avenue, a whole new uh, opportunity for a pay-for-play uh, type arrangement um, that would marginalize organizations and marginalize their ability to go in and advocate and do the work that they've been doing to connect with their members, um, free of any obligation to support uh, members politically, monetarily, or otherwise. Um, we will have some additional uh, resources on this as well, and again, with our partners with the National Council of Nonprofits, truly hoping that this summer is a good time into August to continue to educate members about this issue, uh, let them know that, you know, it's not really a religious liberty issue. It's, it's more of a, a preserving a nonpartisan space, um, and uh, it's something that we care a lot about, and we hope that if it's something that Maybe you don't know as much about now. We can spend a lot of time over the next few weeks educating as much as possible to get you ready. And, of course, federal funding. Um, there's probably not a square inch of the sector that is not impacted in some way by what we're seeing in Washington around federal funding. The Trump administration has put out its budget priorities. While the president's budget is non-binding, there were undoubtedly uh, lots of concerns um, sector-wide, certainly at independent sector as well, about the draconian type cuts that we saw. Um, <clears throat> the good news being that Congress has said um, uh, quite uh, definitively that the president's budget is dead on arrival. We will not take it in its current form. That being said, as Christopher mentioned earlier, the appropriations process is underway. What we're learning is that despite not wanting to make a number of the changes that may have been proposed by the administration, spending cuts are very much alive. They're very much on the docket, and they're under discussion right now. There is a desire to move money away from the non-defense discretionary type programs that, that uh, support many uh, agencies and issues for nonprofit organizations across the country. There are efforts to 
eliminate block grant programs that also provide funding that help support programs across the country. Um, now is the time to, to have those conversations, to talk about what matters to you, what matters to your organization, what matters to those that you serve, how those funds are being used, finding ways to demonstrate exactly the impact and effectiveness, effectiveness that you have um, through the aid and, and help of those federal dollars. So again, with the three issues, uh, there's a, a, another quick slide, just the basics, and we'll have some more information for you on this. Um, we're talking about tax reform. It's the unintended consequence of current proposals potentially having an impact, a negative impact on charitable giving. Um, we think there's an opportunity to expand charitable giving uh, as part of tax reform. We've heard positive uh, feedback from uh, members of Congress, even from the administration. And Ways and Means Chairman Kev Kevin Brady in Ways and Means is responsible for putting together a draft tax reform bill, um, has said that he hopes this process will help unlock more charitable giving. And we certainly want to hold him uh, to that throughout this process. In terms of the Johnson Amendment, there is concern that we, the public trust and the investment in charities would be compromised by a repeal. Uh, and again, this is a tough conversation. It's one that may or may not, although I would uh, I would bet that if you're having a conversation with your member or with staff over the summer, you will be asked um, about how you feel about how this is going. Um, we're continuing to educate members, and we'll do our best to provide you with the, with the materials, with the information uh, to help you make any informed decisions that you need to. And finally, you know, independent sector looks at federal funding from a much broader lens. Understanding many of you have very specific programs, specific appropriations bills of concern. Um, now is the time. August is the time to have those conversations, um, really demonstrate the impact, and let them know um, precisely uh, what a change in funding or government support might mean uh, to, to, to those you serve and, and the work that you're doing. Um, <clears throat> I will say we'll continue to provide as much information as we can on the, the broad spectrum of issues of funding and as we understand them and as the process moves forward. Um, August and September is a very crucial time. Uh, the fiscal year is gonna end and some very tough decisions are going to need to be made. Um, so as Christopher said, you know, as, as much as possible, there are various ways to get in and have these conversations. Um, but my last plug, if you have an opportunity to get them in to see firsthand what you do um, and, and those that, that, that you're working with and impacting every day, that does make all the difference. Thanks, Christopher. Thank you, Jamie. And I, I appreciate that because I find that once I'm able to hear the issues, it does give you a little bit of direction in terms of, well, what are the next steps? If, you know, without a, a group like Independent Sector, it seems like, you know, Washington, you know, might be running out of control or there might be less people in charge than we thought there were in, in the past. But this helps really narrow down to some places where we can hold down the fort and make a difference. So with that, we're going to talk now a little bit about the nuts and bolts of kind of the best ways to make it happen. So I had mentioned uh, that the, if you do try to have one of these exchanges that focuses on you and your issues, it takes a little more effort on your part in terms of planning the agenda and also getting it to happen in terms of scheduling. So Angela Taylor is going to take us through some of those considerations. And then at the end, with any time remaining, we can go back and um, cover any questions you might have related to the specific issues. Angela? Yes, thank you very much, Christopher. Um, so uh, as Christopher said, I've been, uh, I've been scheduling uh, district meetings and site visits for a very long time. I've done literally hundreds of them. Um, and so some of the things that you want to consider um, is your availability and the member's availability. Uh, the onus of flexibility is on you. Um, it, it's, if you're doing a ribbon cutting or something like that or, or someone's getting an award or you're putting up a plaque or something um, and you want the member to be a part of that, then put that as one of the options. Um, if you limit the times that you're available, to provide access to your facilities, your organization, you're, you're not giving them the opportunity to say yes. Um, so make yourselves available. That's, that's my, my first thing is give them as many options as you can when you send the invitation. Um, and it, it's perfectly fine to say, you know, uh, time and date to be determined. And then as you engage with the scheduler, you can, you can arrive at a, at a time that works for both. Um, 
don't plan on a three-hour tour. Uh, one hour is probably the most you're going to get. If the member wants to work in some other things, you'll hear that from the scheduler. Um, for instance, if you have um, – a daycare facility and they also want to meet with some parents and they might want to hang around a little while but they'll let you know that don't plan on this being an all-day affair um, uh, we've, we've talked about your issues if you have some other issues maybe that are affecting you that aren't one of these issues um, bring that up but don't give them a litany of, of uh, issues either um, just like you would do in a Capitol Hill meeting you have to keep it on track so that it doesn't become just a general discussion. We had a good time, and they're not really sure what you wanted them for. Um, so your sample, the sample agenda. Um, generally speaking, we ask you to um, give a tour is is the best thing. Brief introductions to the key people um, should be included in the tour. So if you have certain members of your staff that are important, if they're not going to be along on the tour, then by all means, make sure that they get introduced and have time to speak with the member, if just to say hello. You're going to have some VIPs who want to be on the tour, and that's fine. Um, if if um, you have some politically active directors or CEOs who want to be on it, that's fine. Um, I would caution, however, against making this uh, a free-for-all where it's everybody is going to be able to it's, it's not a town hall meeting situation so you don't want everyone to be able to uh, get in questions and be able to have a, a, a mass talk like I said it's best if you do it in a tour format um, and then at the end of the tour um, have your facts and figures ready your 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 graphs and your data and and about the communities that you serve and where your money comes from and let them draw let them connect the dots if you are sitting down for that entire hour in an office or in a boardroom and just handing around paper, you're wasting an opportunity. That's the meeting you should be having if you're meeting in their district office or if you're meeting with them in Capitol Hill. You want to be sure that your issues and your services and your clients are real um, so that when they go back to Washington and they're asked to make spending cuts or they're asked to make a decision that might impact what you do, they have a very real example of where that funding goes, of, of what that program is. They have that in mind because they've seen it and they've witnessed it and they've experienced it. Um, we have what we call the three question rule. It's not really a rule, it's a guideline. <laughs> um, and what that is, is if you can get the member to ask three questions, then they are hooked, then they are immersed. Um, so your idea is to show them this is a learning experience for them, this is informative. This is not a hard ask like when you go to the, the, the hill and, and you have a specific issue. This is a very soft sell. Again, you show them what you do, you explain to them where your funding comes from, and they connect the dots. And then you might, you know, and, and then explain that this is, comes from the kinds of funding that is, is, is potentially being cut by the new budget. Um, but do not discuss um, electoral politics. Um, you don't want to discuss campaigns. You don't want to discuss contributions, certainly. Um, and you don't want to uh, tread into that realm. You certainly don't want to talk about fundraising. Um, inviting a lot of people um, also has the potential of taking it off message. And by that, I mean that if someone wants, if, if your CEO comes and what your CEO is really excited about is the new wing, then the conversation might become about the new wing. Um, and you also want to make sure that everyone on the tour is engaged on the issue. So make sure they're briefed on the issue ahead of time so that they understand that this is, this is what you've sold to the scheduler. And that's an important thing to understand is that the scheduler has told the member that this is what this meeting is about. And so if it goes off topic and the, meet, and the member is caught off guard, then he or she is not having a good experience, and that doesn't reflect well on your organization. Um, I, I always ask people to not inform news media. Um, it's, it's awkward if the media is invited, because then the member can be caught unawares with questions off topic, um, especially in a situation like this. It's a learning environment for your member of Congress, so they're not really ready to answer questions even about your issues at this point. You've invited them there to learn about it. He or she may want to make it a media event. Let that be their decision. 
Um, you should definitely get photos of, you know, of what's going on. And if you want to promote it afterwards, by all means, you know, let the scheduler know that you're going to do it. Your PR person is going to be there and you're going to promote it. If you do put it on social media, tag the member so that they can see what you're saying about them. They always love that when you tag them in their in photos on social media. Um, and I, I, this final caution, we always like to avoid a situation where um, you're, you're spending a lot of time organizing lunch and giving them gifts and, and making it that sort of event. The purpose is for them to be educated about your environment, about your services, about your clients. And so keep the focus on that. Um, in a lot of cases, they feel then, especially if you're, if you're giving them a gift of some kind, um, you know, even, even a sweatshirt with your logo on it or something like that, then they're left in this awkward position of, of accepting a gift that they weren't expecting. And, and it's, it sounds silly, but they're very often taken aback by that. Um, if they're not expecting to address a group, please don't put them on a stage. Please don't put a microphone in front of them. They will not appreciate being asked to make remarks for which they were not uh, um, prepared. Um, they will ask, the schedule will generally ask if they're going to be making remarks. Um, and again, I would, not, I, I would not advise that because your purpose is for them to learn about you, um, not for them to speak to you. That's a different kind of event. So um, we have... And there's Representative Hurt handling a tarantula at the University of Virginia. Um, that, was a, that was a site visit that we set up for them to see a lab that tests uh, um, responses to anxiety. So there they were testing the members' response to anxiety. Um, your typical site visit takes, I would say, on average, 12 phone call email exchanges. Um, that is an average based on a very low number and a very high number, however. Um, some of them may take one or two. Some of them may take dozens. Some of them take a very long time to schedule. And you, you might request August, and the scheduler may come back to you and suggest the winter recess or may suggest another date uh, later in the year. Um, I, 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 like I said, the, the, be as flexible as possible. It's always on you. It's difficult to maintain the momentum. I appreciate that when things go long. When you've, when you've told your advocates or your clients specifically, we want you to be available in, in August, you know, because we, the member is going to come and we'll let you know when. And then when that goes into September and then October, and you still have everybody on hold waiting for that to happen, it's difficult. And, and, and I appreciate that, but you have to keep them engaged um, while you're keeping your request on the scheduler's desk. So they will tell you, I don't have anything, call me back in four weeks. So you let everyone know we're going to try again in four weeks just to keep them in the loop. There's nothing worse than having everybody drop out. So they will ask you for an agenda. Uh, typically, it, a rough agenda is fine. You don't have to break it down by the minute. You're, we're we're going to tour this facility. You're going to meet these people, and then we're going to have a 10-minute discussion before you leave in our boardroom. And that's fine. That's all they want to know. They will want to know the names of every single person they're going to meet. They do not want to be ambushed by someone who they were not expecting to meet, especially if it's somebody important. Um, if, you know, the, the CEO or the president comes and they weren't expecting to meet that person, um, then they're taken aback. They, they want to know everyone who's going to be there. And their titles, certainly. Um, titles of everyone who's going to be there, um, and of course what issues you're going to want to discuss um, in the broad sense. It doesn't need to be uh, terribly specific, but generally what I say is that we want to show you our efforts, the efforts we're making towards this issue, so that they understand that it's a tour. Um, the most important thing is this. while it takes a long time to schedule these, very often takes a long time to schedule them, just the same they may be scheduled at the drop of a hat. It has happened more than once when you get a phone call from a scheduler for something you've been pursuing for 12 weeks, you will suddenly get a phone call. Um, something has fallen off the schedule tomorrow afternoon. Are you available? You have to have what I call the bat phone. You have to have given the scheduler the bat phone. And you have to have the contact information for everyone who's going to be on this tour so that you can round everybody up. There is not an option sometimes for a 48-hour response time. You have to be able to say, yes, 
on a dime. So make sure that the scheduler knows how to reach you and make sure you know how to reach anyone else you're scheduling for. Um, as I mentioned, we want to go to um, beyond August recess. There's um, the house specifically, they're home practically a week every single month. And it's sometimes easier if you wait until after they're busy um, in the town hall season in August. That sometimes it's easier to, to wait until October, November, uh, even the holidays. Keep in mind that if the recess week falls during a specific holiday, um, if it falls you know, during Veterans Day week, a lot of their activities are gonna be veterans related. So if your group isn't veterans related, you know, don't, assu don't assume that you're gonna be able to get something going that week. Um, you know, likewise with Memorial Day or something like that. Um, but generally it's a day or two around the holiday and then the rest of that week is pretty free. So keep that in mind as well. If you are offered a meeting, and you will be <laughs> in some cases, with a district director, accept that meeting. Never say no um, to a, a meeting. It's how you build the relationship. And that's the, the first step um, in many cases is meeting with another member of the staff. The district director has your information, knows your, knows your details, has the, the issues, the organization in mind, and relates that to the member. And then you've taken that step towards building a relationship with the member. So the next time you approach the member, you'll, you're that much closer because they know who you are. Um, any more than you might take a meeting with someone you don't know, the member is hesitant if they don't know what the issue is. And they may send out a district director to take that meeting in advance. Um, there we go. Woohoo! <laughs> Christopher, do you want to cover this or shall I? Oh, you can. You can. Okay. Um, Soapbox does do this for our clients, and it's something we can set up as part of the as part of the network. There's um, a few ways to do this. You, if you decide to participate, um, you let us know, and we'll get in touch with you and talk about what it is you want them to see, what your site visit would be, and what those dates might be. If you have a specific, like, if you have a ribbon cutting or you're setting a plaque or something like that that you want to work around, you'd let us know that. Um, we would then get you um, your advocates, um, you know, all the details about your advocates that you want to get in, into the, the meeting so that I can communicate that to the scheduler um, and that, that phone number so, so that I can, I can connect with you there. Um, and then keeping you in the loop, reaching out to the scheduling office, keeping you in the loop, let you know where we are throughout the entire process. And then once it's set up, uh, let you know and let IS know, an independent sector then reaches out to you and gives you a quick update on the issues, a briefing so that you know where you are, provides any support materials, uh, you know, leave behind folders, um, uh, documentation that you're gonna hand off to the member. Um, and then we, and then after the event, um, you, you let IS know how it went, let them know where they stand on the issues, and of course share photos. Uh, we always like to have photos that we can share success stories for scheduling. Um, we are offering a 10% discount for the IS network. Um, if you if you're interested, give me a call um, after the webinar, and I'll discuss that uh, discuss that rate and pricing with you, and discuss how you can get started. And if you can get a member of Congress on a helicopter, you win. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, this is David Joyce from a few years ago, and they gave him a ride on a helicopter, and uh, that was. Um, when uh, when I told when I told the scheduler that they wanted to take him on a helicopter ride, that that sold that sold the meeting. Great. Now, so this is Christopher again. I know we're at the end of our hour, so what I want to do is just take a couple minutes and see if we can answer any questions, Angela. I want to get folks off the phone. Um, by about 4.05, so let's see if we can answer two or three questions. And then I've put on the screen here, if we don't get your, to your policy or issue-related question, um, I've put Jamie Tucker's email on the screen here. Feel free to reach out to him. If you uh, have questions about um, district meetings and site visits or town halls that we haven't answered, um, or you would like to hear uh, what we can do for your organization in terms of the independent sector agenda, feel free to reach out to Angela. I have her email on the screen here. Um, Angela, are there uh, any questions that people have typed? We can take a few of those. 
I am not seeing any questions okay. right now. Okay, so we'll give we'll, we'll wait just a, a minute as we wrap up here. Um, you know, one of the things that that I would add to this is that if it all seems overwhelming and too detailed, and you have a very small organization and you're new at this, that's part of your calculus of what you would like to do. So maybe attending a town hall meeting is something you should consider doing before. Um, trying to become the local advocate on tax reform um, in a public setting. So um, we go from our very small and new organizations that uh, might choose strategically that their first step is to get their feet wet all the way on to through uh, trying to see who has locations where the Ways and Means members are and the Senate Finance members are. Uh, so we can uh, really focus on hitting some of the key members of Congress. Between those two things are where all of the IS network members are. So some organizations have a lot of experience with this. Some organizations have a lot of locations. Some organizations have one location. The important thing is for folks to think about finding a way to build relationships with their members of Congress really with their elected representatives at the federal, state, and local levels in a way that matches your interests and your availability and the other resources you have in terms of grassroots uh, so that you can start building from where you are and, um, and, not, and, and what we're trying not to do is impose a top-down method where we say you have to do X, Y, and Z or you're not doing it right. So there are choices to be made and some of those choices focus on you and your organization and just exactly where you are and what you have time for. And, and keep so in mind that, that your Angela, facility, yeah, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I was saying keep in mind that uh, with that, your um, organization, your offices might not be the best place uh, to have the member. If you're providing services out of your office, um, for instance, I, I had a group that built um, disabled ramps and, and, and so on onto a, a farmer's home who had become disabled. And so they took them out to the farmer's home to show them what they had done. So don't, don't assume that just coming to your office and meeting your staff is, is, is what you need to show if your services are not there. Mm -hmm. Good point. Okay, with that, if I'm not hearing any questions, I will leave up on the screen uh, Jamie's email and Angela's email. We appreciate everybody taking the time. You are just ahead of the wave in Washington, D.C., starting to think about August recess. So we look forward to seeing you out there and making our collective issues and independent sector visible this August so that we can be a priority when folks come back to finish up the year. Thank you, everybody. I'll stop the recording now, but I will continue to keep the emails on the screen.